Chapter Four of This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Greg Marguerite. This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch. Chapter Four. Harry Collins, Two Thousand. Harry didn't ask any questions. He just kept his mouth shut and waited. Maybe Dr. Manshoff suspected, and maybe he didn't. Anyway, there was no trouble. Harry figured there wouldn't be as long as he stayed in line and went through the proper motions. It was all a matter of pretending to conform, pretending to agree, pretending to believe. So he watched his step, except in his dreams, and then he was always falling into the yawning abyss. He kept his nose clean, but in the dreams he smelled the blood and brimstone of the pit. He managed to retain a cheerful smile at all times, though in the dreams he screamed. Eventually he met Myrna. She was the pretty little brunette whom Richie had mentioned, and she did her best to console him. Only in dreams, when he embraced her, he was embracing a writhing coil of slimy smoke. It may have been that Harry Collins went a little mad, just having to pretend that he was sane. But he learned the way, and he managed. He saved the madness, or was it the reality, for the dreams. Meanwhile, he waited and said nothing. He said nothing when, after three months or so, Myrna was suddenly transferred without warning. He said nothing when, once a week or so, he went to visit with Dr. Manshoff. He said nothing when Manshoff volunteered the information that Ritchie had been transferred to or suggested that it would be best to stay on for further therapy. And he said nothing when still a third nurse came his way, a woman who was callid, complacent, and nauseatingly nymphomaniac. The important thing was to stay alive, stay alive, and try to learn. It took him almost an additional year to find out what he wanted to find out. More than eight months passed before he found a way of sneaking out of his room at night and a way of getting into that third unit through a delivery door which was occasionally left open through negligence. Even then all he learned was that the female patients did have their living quarters here, along with the members of the staff and, presumably, Dr. Leffingwell. Many of the women were patients rather than nurses, as claimed, and a good number of them were in various stages of pregnancy. But this proved nothing. Several times Harry debated the possibilities of taking some of the other men in his unit into his confidence. Then he remembered what had happened to Arnold Ritchie and decided against this course. The risk was too great. He had to continue alone. It wasn't until Harry managed to get into Unit 4 that he got what he wanted, what he didn't want, and learned that reality and dreams were one and the same. There was the night, more than a year after he'd come to the treatment center when he finally broke into the basement and found the incinerators. And the incinerators led to the operating and delivery chambers. And the delivery chambers led to the laboratory. And the laboratory led to the incubators. And the incubators led to the nightmare. In the nightmare, Harry found himself looking down at the mistakes and the failures, and he recognized them for what they were, and he knew then why the incinerators were kept busy and why the black smoke poured. In the nightmare he saw the special units containing those which were not mistakes or failures, and in a way they were worse than the others. They were red and wriggling there beneath the glass, and on the glass surfaces hung the charts which gave the data. Then Harry saw the names, and saw his own name repeated twice, once for Sue, once for Myrna, and he realized that he had contributed to the successful outcome or issue of the experiments. Outcome? Issue? these horrors? And that was why Manshoff must have chosen to take the risk of keeping him alive, because he was one of the good guinea pigs, and he spawned, spawned living, mewing abominations. He had dreamed of these things, and now he saw that they were real, so that nightmare merged with now, and he gazed down at it with open eyes and screamed at last with open mouth. Then, of course, an attendant came running although he seemed to be moving ever so slowly because everything moves so slowly in a dream. And Harry saw him coming and lifted a bell glass and smashed it down over the man's head, slowly, ever so slowly. And then he heard the others coming and he climbed out of the window and ran. The searchlights winked across the courtyards and the sirens vomited hysteria from metallic throats and the night was filled with shadows that pursued. 
But Harry knew where to run. He ran straight through the nightmare, through all the fantastic but familiar convolutions of sight and sound, and then he came to the river and plunged in. Now the nightmare was not sight or sound, but merely sensation. Icy cold and distilled darkness, ripples that ran and raced and roiled and roared. But there had to be a way out of the nightmare, and there had to be a way out of the canyon, and that way was the river. Apparently no one else had thought of the river. Perhaps they had considered it as a possible avenue of escape and then discarded the notion when they realized how it ripped and raged among the rocks as it finally plunged from the canyon's mouth. Obviously no one could hope to combat that current and survive. But strange things happen in nightmares, and you fight the numbness and the blackness, and you claw and convulse, and you twist and turn and toss, and then you ride the crests of frenzy and plunge into the troughs of panic and despair, and you sweep round and round and sink down into nothingness until you break through to the freedom which comes only with oblivion. Somewhere beyond the canyon's moiling maw Harry Collins found that freedom and that oblivion. He escaped from the nightmare just as he escaped from the river. The river itself roared on without him, and the nightmare continued too. End of Chapter 4 of This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch